Okay, so uh, good evening to everybody. It's a pleasure to have you all with us. This is the third webinar that is organized jointly by the Institute for Sustainable Development of the European Public Organization, NEPLO, and the ANEOSIS. And it is my pleasure to welcome uh, Thodoris Yorgakopoulos, who is the editorial director of the ANEOSIS. And we have with us two um, expert speakers, two uh, actually very renowned speakers and, and uh, uh, figures in their field. One, the first one that you see is Aris Vretos, who is the director of the Center for Business Transformation of the Cambridge Institute for Sustainability Leadership. Ari, thank you for being with us. And the second speaker is Sebastian Treyer, who is the executive director of IDRI, the Institute for Sustainable Development and International Relations from Paris. Uh, it's a great pleasure to have you both with us. And as a matter of introduction, I will say just a few things that, um, as I said before, this is the third webinar that we are organizing, uh, looking into the effects of the uh, COVID pandemic and how this relates to sustainable development. Sorry, the title for this one, the third webinar, is called The Silent Spring in Inverse. Those involved with environmental issues might remember that in 1962, um, that's even before me actually, so I'm not that old. Um, my brother is though. And uh, so in 1962, Razor Carlson put out a book that was named The Silent Spring, and it was about the effect that pesticides had on nature so that things were becoming more silent, birds, um, insects and so on because of the massive use of DDT and other pesticides at the time. What actually we went, we tried to say by the title of this, um, this event is that in this case, it was the inverse of a silent spring because human activity had been reduced to a bare minimum because of the pandemic because people had to be uh, close at home with the lockdowns. Um, air traveling had been reduced to almost zero, traveling in the streets and moving in the streets with cars and so on. So we saw the uh, inverse effect of nature actually regaining some space. We saw wildlife taking place in cities and so on. And the question that we wanted to discuss with our speakers today is that this was an unprecedented experiment. I mean, we never had the possibility to do that in normal times. Unfortunately, we got the chance to do it with a lot of cost for human lives. First of all, a lot of human pain, but also very high cost to the economy. And still what we think is worth discussing is if there are any positive um, outcomes or any positive conclusions or anything positive that can come from this experience and lessons that we can learn for the future in terms of, uh, of how things are done. What I would propose that we do today is after I give the floor to Thodoris Hirogakopoulos to welcome you on behalf of the Aneosis. After that, we will have a very short quiz. Uh, it's a very small quiz of, uh, of uh, five questions that all of you will be able to participate in and vote. I will take you step by step through it so you will know how to do it. And um, then we will have an introductory um, remarks by first Aris Vretos and then Sebastian Treyer. Um, and then we'll enter the discussion. Let me remind you that through the Zoom uh, webinar that you are linked in, you can um, post your questions in the Q&A or the chat. We'll be monitoring both. And so if you want to participate with a question, please feel free to do that. Our team will be monitoring questions and will be passing them to us if we're missing something. Um, and also that for those of you who want to link, I mean, if you're listening to us, that doesn't make much sense what I'm saying, but the uh, whole event is also being transmitted live on YouTube on our channel, which you can find on the invitation. With this and without saying anything more, I would like to invite Thodoris to uh, welcome our attendees and our speakers on behalf of the Aneos. Thank you so much, Spiros, again, for this invitation to participate in this series of, uh, of online events. Uh, they have, they have something in common. Interesting ideas always come up in these discussions and I'm really interested in hearing what our guests have in this uh, particular discussion today because the sustainable development conundrum is even more important and crucial now during a pandemic that has triggered a massive recession around the world. In our country, in Greece, we are facing a severe challenge to drastically change the way we produce our energy over the coming few years. 
And at the same time, we also have to change our economic model and shift from a heavy reliance on tourism, for example, to industrial production and other export driven industries. And we need to put more people to work because we already had a massive economic crisis to deal with. So in that um, a frame, framework, I'm really eager to learn about ideas, strategies and specific policies that have been implemented or are being implemented elsewhere. And I hope that, I hope that from this discussion today, I and our viewers will be able to translate the general idea of sustainable development into more specific examples and concepts. And I'm really interested in hearing more about these issues and about the concept of, of Silent, Silent Spring, which I found very inventive and interesting. Thank you very much, Sodori. So before I invite our two speakers, uh, I will share with you this short quiz that I mentioned before. What you will see on your screens now, you can actually join either through your um, computer or you can use your mobile phones. Usually it's easier to do it through on your, your own mobile phone. If you go to, sorry, if you go to this website, www.menti.com, uh, you will be required to type in the code 610313. Can you please try to do this? I will be monitoring how many people have registered on the Menti. So it's www.menti.com. And as soon as you join, you will be able to see the first card that I will share with you on which you will be able to vote. There will be five statements. You are uh, required to vote which one of the statements you think is correct. There are three correct ones and there are two wrong ones. And you will be able to uh, vote which one you think is best. I'm still waiting for like a short minute. There's people logging in on Menti. We already have around 15 people that have logged in and I will just give it a second more so that more people can come on. And now you can start voting. Remember that three questions are right and two are wrong, so you can vote for whichever you like. And there we go, we have nine people that voted for reduced pollution and CO2 emissions. We have three people voting for less flight mice traveled. And we have one person that interestingly voted about less plastic being used, which is not the correct answer. And I think that will be a point that we can discuss later on. So now I'll stop my sharing and we'll go to the introductory remarks by first Aris Vretos from the Cambridge Institute for Sustainability Leadership and then Sebastian Treye, who will be invited to comment on things, but there will be more quizzes later on. So uh, don't leave Menti, stay with Menti. Ari, thank you again for being with us and you have the floor. Thank you, Spiro, and thank you uh, everyone. It's, it's good to, um, to be involved in this very um, interesting conversation. Um, I, um, let me just, um, it, it's a, let me just say, if, if, if you don't mind, Spirit, just a one word about my institute, uh, Please. Uh, Sustainability Leadership at the University of Cambridge. And we are a 30 year old institute, uh, part of the School of Technology. And um, we work predominantly with um, our key audiences, our um, policymakers, uh, financial system, and um, business leaders. And we, we work a lot. Um, trying to progress the thinking when it comes to policy making, uh, uh, supporting uh, organizations who have a voice in what progressive policies looks like, um, carbon, climate change, business and nature, and, and, and so on. We work a lot with the finance sector. What does a sustainable financial system looks like uh, with uh, asset managers, with banks, with insurance, you know, what can, what kind of, um, how do we optimize the impact of portfolios? How can we uh, better communicate and uh, be transparent about the carbon intensity, about the true financial risks of our investments? And then finally, we work a lot, obviously, with businesses. And that's where 
the, the Center for Business Transformation comes in, we have a mission to help business play a transformative role for a sustainable economy. And um, we, uh, our goal is to try and get to the big questions. What is the new role of business in society? What is the impact of business? And then what types of strategies enable businesses to play that role? What change is necessary and so on. So that's just a, a, a way of, of introducing CISL, but um, it, it will kind of come in handy as I start talking about um, some of the things that we are um, looking at in, in Cambridge. So um, the first thing to say um, in, in a conversation like this is there's a lot we don't know. Um, and and a, lot of the, a lot of the questions are being asked at the moment. It will take years to kind of address some of those issues, to document them, to record, to understand how some of these um, themes, how some of these trends evolve. I guess one thing we all know at least all of us working in sustainability, is this, this isn't a surprise. However tragic this is, however difficult this is, this isn't really a surprise. We've seen it come up, come up in various scenarios and uh, we've been preparing for things like this and what many people say is gonna be uh, challenging decades ahead when it comes to climate change and ecological crisis. So that's, um, uh, you know, as we've entered this, era of the Anthropocene, where the, the kind of the human species has dominated life on the planet. Now we're kind of settling to what is being called, I think, the Anthropos, you know, the, the kind of the, the, the lockdown, the, the halt in, in economic activity that's been created. And you, you know, we, we've seen you know, many examples of this. I have monarch butterflies and hedgehogs in my garden for the first time in seven years here in Cambridge. You know, we, we haven't had that previously. There's birds singing outside my, my window every day. But, you know, we, we see, you know, we've seen reports of kangaroos roaming the streets of Adelaide in Australia. You see alligators in the gardens uh, in, in U.S. cities. You see deer resting in southeast London. You know, we've seen the videos from Venice and how the waters of the canals have become much cleaner. So there's many examples, walruses in Argentina, you know, wildlife has, is, is claiming back in the absence of, of, of man. Significantly, the decline, the sort of the fall of uh, transport and travel emissions and car transport, and of course, all of us working, uh, at least those of us who have the luxury of being able to do so, working remotely from home. Um, we've seen a big halt in, in global emissions. I think um, over March and April, uh, we've seen a global decline approximately of 17% of CO2 emissions. Um, China, has, uh, which has been hardest hit to some degree by the crisis, has seen you know, um, reductions in CO2 equivalent to what the UK emits in half a year. Uh, you see, you've seen pictures of the north of Italy, and the quality of, of, of air and how that has changed dramatically. And of course, there's a, the other side to that coin is that it has had, as you, Spiro, as you said, a big social and human and economic cost. So we, we, we've, um, the, the other thing that, that's kind of um, significant for me is that with all this hold, you know, with it, there's very little happening to some degree, we still emit sort of 87 or 85 percent of our annual emissions you know the system is in motion yeah and there is a there is a lot of um uh, momentum in the system and um some scientists kind of um describe it as you know uh, to look at carbon dioxide you know as a, as a as a bathtub that's slowly filling up and then suddenly you you reduce the flow of the tap you know it's still filling up we still have to get rid all of that carbon uh, from from the atmosphere, for example, um, but you know there is we we have seen some very interesting ways about um, some interesting things about what is possible, and I think we're, we're going to talk about that in the next couple of of, of minutes. Um, and what is it that um, we have been able to do, um, and what is it that we think we're going to learn as a result? I um, I think it's it's uh, this isn't a positive story. Yeah, we, uh, we have to be clear about that. This is, we didn't choose to do this. And maybe we choose to do 
some of the things that we're doing at the moment in the future, but we haven't chosen to do this. And, um, you know, in, in the UK where I live, you've seen something like 20% of lost GDP. You've seen the biggest rise in unemployment um, since records began, I think. You've seen entire sectors where a lot of people rely for jobs, livelihoods, and so on, and to kickstart the economy completely obliterated. You mentioned tourism and leisure. That's been one of the sectors hardest hit. Obviously, transport um, and uh, many other areas, uh, retail, have been really um, affected. That has brought you know, some, some wonderful examples from company reactions, people reactions, community reactions, which I'd like to flag as we move on to, to the conversation. But, you know, it has raised, you know, exacerbated some of the issues we faced. Inequality is one. You know, it's, you know, most of us on this call have the luxury of continuing to work and earn a living. But, you know, tradesmen, people working in construction, people, you know, driving cars for a living, they've been the hardest hits. And so you've, you, you see how, you know, the, the crisis landed on a plane of economic inequality and it's making it bigger and bigger. And of course, you know, it's not, it's, um, you know, we, the movement of Black Lives Matter and other similar movements kind of are in, an interesting reflection of what's happened. Um, in, in, a, in, in this, in this um, trend. So I'll pause, I'll pause here. Um, the, the, there's many examples that we can bring into this conversation, a lot of interesting lessons, but I, I, again, I wanna highlight a lot of questions that we're just starting to look into and we'll need to, to revisit over the next couple of months and years. Ari, thank you very much. I, uh, I'm really grateful for all the points that you raised. Actually, the monarch butterflies is something that I noticed in my own garden, and we were discussing that with my wife the other day, that we've never seen such concentration of butterflies and many other species. But I think all the socioeconomic points that you raised as well are very, very valid. I will not comment on them, and I will not ask Thodoris to do it right now, because I would like to invite Sebastian Treyer of Idri to take the floor and do your opening remarks. Sebastian, thank you again for being with us. You have the floor. Thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, just a few words also on where I'm speaking from. So Idri is a think tank established in Paris, but we work both on, on uh, domestic policies, uh, meaning the French and the European policies on, on sustainability, but also on international negotiations. Um, and, and I think I'm going to talk mainly from the, uh, from the French perspective. That might be quite useful. I think the first thing that strikes me, I really like the way that you put this idea of a reverse silent spring because it's, it's really uh, enabling us to reflect on what's happened and also putting the emphasis on nature and not just on climate. And I think that's very important uh, if, we, if we try to think of what can we learn. To some extent at Idri, we work both on climate change and biodiversity degradation. And even if it, climate change seems complicated as a collective action problem, biodiversity degradation is even worse. So to me, putting the emphasis on that is particularly important. The, the thing that struck me, seen from Paris and, my, and the, the room in which, uh, the, the, the flat in which I was confined is the idea that Yes, it was interest, impressive to see the, 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 the decrease in, in the, uh, green, greenhouse gases emissions, but to some extent it, it's, it, it's really showing that our economy is, we just have one big switch, binary switch on the economy, which means that either we have economic growth that goes, that is a kind of a necessary condition for prosperity today and environmental degradation, or we have environmental protection, but without, then we need to, uh, to, uh, to, to say bye-bye to economic growth. And that means also bye-bye to, uh, to, to, to prosperity. So, so what I mean by that is that first, uh, it's really showing that we have not succeeded in the dematerialization of our economy, which was a pro has been a promise uh, or a kind of a horizon, not a promise, but an aspirational horizon for sustainability policies. So decoupling economic growth from its material footprint has not functioned for the moment. Uh, and the other thing that is important is that for the moment, if we don't have growth, we don't have prosperity, we don't have social insurance, we don't have a social welfare state. And that's also something that is very important. So because I, I believe in sustainability, what we are aiming for is prosperity uh, and not growth. Uh, but if we want prosperity for the moment, we don't know how to do that without growth and the uh, and the environmental impact that goes with it. So to some extent, I think it's, it would be very dangerous to try and convince the rest of society, those who are not 
in favor of sustainability, not necessarily in favor of sustainability policies. They, if you convince them by showing, look, it's possible, we can just switch off the economy and then everything is going to be good. The, the brutality of the social consequences is very harsh. And for this, we need to really use that example just to show that things that we thought were not possible are certainly possible, but we, it does not mean that it's, the, the brutality of the, of the lockdown is something that we can't, we can't cope with it because we need much more progressive transitions. At the, at the same time, while I really know that the emergency, the environmental emergency is very important. So there is a, an issue of the time frame that we can afford that is, that is, that is very complicated and illustrated by, by, by the crisis. Um, the last thing that I want to say on that is that, of course, um, I, I've discussed that with colleagues in India and China. What, even, even for those who have lost their jobs, they can't, they can't really uh, notice that uh, cities have be, had become more livable. Uh, levels of air pollution and, and the health conditions of people had really changed in cities. So to some extent, one of the lessons is also to show that some of our economic structures uh, in some sectors or the organization of our cities are unsustainable because we, we are suddenly we have in front of our eyes the idea that it could be differently organized and much more livable. But that, it, of course, it takes time to do that. But so so that, that's this idea of the big switch to me is very important. The, the other thing that, that I think I would like to introduce as a question is, because that was uh, implicit in your questions, uh, Spiros, was the idea of uh, lifestyles. What, we, we've changed our lifestyles. Why not change our lifestyles and be more sustainable? And, and I think that's something that is very, very, very complicated. The French philosopher uh, Bruno Latour has said, we've learned the barrier gestures against the virus. Let's learn the barrier gestures to, to avoid getting back on the tracks of, of unsustainable uh, development. But that's a very strange way. I mean, he's, he's very smart. But if you listen just to the title of the paper, it looks like it's an individual responsibility. And we could just choose to, to live differently. And that's very complicated because I think he was appealing more to public mobilization, collective mobilization than just individual behaviors. But we are, I, I think what, what was interesting in the crisis was the level of philosophical reflection through irony that people had. Uh, and I mean that by this, probably everybody, not just we, the uh, well-educated in some, because we have a superior education. I mean, everybody was looking on their smartphone to the, the, the irony of the situation. And that is very good for our philosophical reflection. But, and, and so many people were, I, I believe everybody was reflecting about what is the priority? What is the, the meaning of my life? But without, you, you can't now say that this enables everybody to choose because some of the people cannot afford to change their lifestyles and behaviors because they need to go and, and have a job even with, when the virus is there, they need to use those are this type of transportation because they have no collective transportation, so they need to take the car if they're in a remote place in France. And that links back to the Yellow Vest movements. What we tried to do, what Macron tried to do, was to try and implement an increase in the carbon tax that was trying to shift the behaviors of people towards less fossil fuel uh, consumption. But in the end, what, what the, the, the protests came from the fact that people could not change that easily when they were in a remote a peri-urban area in Montpellier, southern France. You don't have enough collective transportation. Your jobs is far, are far away. You need to use your car, and 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 you have a your you, your your budget as a as a, as a household is very very complicated. So the issue of vulnerability, inequality was very present, and that sh we should bear in mind when we think that changing lifestyle is possible. Uh, and and particularly, what I think is very present now is that. If you would have a public intervention to say, no, you need to change your lifestyle, this idea that we could govern our lifestyles through public intervention, that's good. I mean, the frustration is very hard. People have accepted the types of discipline that we had to have because of health reasons, but they're not going to, to, to because that was to some extent to protect the elders, to protect one another or protect oneself. But, but then if for, for the sake of the environment, this is going to be unacceptable because people know that it's not their individual choices because there is the whole structure that prevents them from, from having choices. And I, I mentioned the, the, the infrastructures for transportation. You could also say just if you want to buy better food or more environmental uh, food of, uh, that is more sustainable, maybe you don't access it if you, if you live in a food desert 
or if you if the supply the offer that is proposed by the food industry is not proposing the type of food that you need and, and, and that you can't afford to, 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 to pay so so that that to me is very important and the last point that I would like to make is to say um, nevertheless I think that there are interesting things that might be happening and useful for nature uh, and that's particularly the idea that um, uh, some space has been made in some of the industries, and I think of the agri-food industry, because the, your, your, your introduction was on, on, on Silent Spring, which is an, an issue of, uh, of pesticides. So to what extent can we, uh, for instance, think that the, uh, the crisis is an opportunity to, to live without pesticides? Um, and I think that this is a critical question, because we know in France that we've been already trying for more than 10 years, we had in 2008, the objective to say by 2018, we will reduce by half the use of pesticides. And then a comma was added, if possible. And then in the end, the objective was just left aside because it was too complicated. And 15 years after that, we still have farmers saying we have no alternative to pesticides, which is not possible in terms, not for them, but for the collective French, French society. Say so we have not developed the possibility. And the thing that I want to say is the question is not so much a technological alternative that is lacking. It's the idea that if you want to use less pesticides, you need to have more diverse crop rotations, more diverse agricultural landscapes, which means more diverse markets. And this is the issue of the food industry where you need to reintroduce diversity instead of economies of scale, massification and standardization. Where I'm coming to, I'm sorry, because this might seem like a very strange way to answer your question. I think with the crisis we hear uh, CEOs of companies like Danone, Emmanuel Faber, so a multinational company but French-based, um, uh, Danone, uh, Faber has been advocating a lot for re-diversifying raw materials and products in the food industry as the horizon for a complete new uh, business model in the food industry. But that necessitates to shift completely from a mass production to a re-diversified production. And I don't know who, how he would do that with his uh, shareholders. And he's saying, I need more resilience in my supply chains. Resilience might be helped by diversity. And he has a narrative that might function. So there are things that we could take of the story of the crisis to say there are some things that we learn, but they're not directly linked to our own lifestyles. It's much more at the structural scale that this might happen. Thank you very much, Sebastian. You raised a lot of very interesting points that relate not only to the French dimension, but also to the very real life. So I think it came on as a very, very good addition to what Iris told us about the um, complication and the um, complexity of the socioeconomic issues. And you connected that to a number of different industries and facets of, of everyday life. Um, I will not ask, I will not comment on what you said right away. First, I would like to ask Todoris if you would like to make any comments on, on the points that were raised as an introductory um, remarks by our two speakers. Well, I have one comment to throw in the discussion. Maybe we can pick up on it later. Picking up from what Mr. Treye said, um, I think that the message from the Silent Spring, one of the messages that came out of this Silent Spring is that climate change and environmental pro problems in general are, are, can be solved by drastically changing our modern way of life. And I think that this is a message that can be dangerous. It's espoused by some activists, but it's not uh, espoused by the vast majority of people. And so on some level, uh, if people agree that we can solve climate change by uh, massive changes in the way our societies and the economies work, then many people will see this as an impossible effort. We cannot sustainably stay locked up in our houses and work from, um, from our bedrooms. Uh, but people don't want to make uh, drastic changes for prolonged periods of time. And the silence of the spring gave way to a relatively loud summer. So I would like to uh, ask for a comment on that idea. Maybe there is a dangerous message com coming out from this silent spring and how we can rectify that. Um, if I can add something to what uh, you, Thodori, just said in relation to the comments made by our two speakers, um, I have two points that I wanted to, to raise on this. One is that I very much, I found very interesting the point that uh, Sebastian made about the lifestyles and the need to change lifestyles. 
And in fact, we have also a question and a comment that came from uh, a very good friend to some of us, Aram Hobala, who is uh, also a member of the advisory board of uh, the Institute for Sustainable Development. And one thing he was saying is that um, in reaction to the pandemic, we have seen a lot of stakeholders, uh, even the very bigger ones like UN agencies and so on, that changed a little bit the narrative and they used what we call very often the greenwashing for sustainability as a, as a pandemic washing. So saying instead of finding the root causes why we have not managed to address the key issues like climate change and changing the lifestyles and the production and consumption and so on, now we use the same narrative just to make a wishful thinking of what should be done as a result of the pandemic and how everything has to be changed. So I think what you mentioned is important to take into account that if we drop into the same kind of narrative that we did before for sustainability and we say, let's change everything, we will not change much. And I think that the step-by-step -step approach and the actual things that we can change, we have been discussing in the past with Iris about how we actually saw that it is very much possible to avoid a lot of traveling that we used to do because we're running from one meeting to the other. And it turned out that we could do a lot of work just by doing a teleconference. So that saved a lot of traveling. And we could remember this once all the restrictions are, are uh, lifted. Same thing about what Sebastian said um, for food production. Uh, I think that the pandemic and all the changes they have actually had a very, very high cost on the livelihoods and the um, possibility of the poor to be able to support their families. I was speaking yesterday with a friend in France and he was telling me how much there is a very steep rise in the movement of urban agriculture, how people want to produce more food closer to their homes or within their homes actually, to stop having this endless chain of transporting food across the globe because that's, that's how it used to be. So things like that that are connected to real life and are actually meeting a positive reaction from people could be things that we can look at. Um, I'm opening the um, floor for any comments from Iris and Sebastian. And when you complete your first round of, of follow-up remarks, then we'll go to the next step of our voting, if you're in agreement with me. So, Ari or Sebastian, okay, whoever wants. Thank, all right, thank you, Sebastian. I'll, I'll go first, Merci. So, um, I mean, th those are uh, very good comments and, and good question by Thodori. I think, um, I think you need all kinds of things. I think it would be, we need different approaches. We've seen that. We need some incremental steps. We need some low hanging fruit. We need some genuinely new thinking and we do need to challenge the system. And I'll tell you, I completely agree. We cannot ask individual citizens to internalize the costs of capitalism. Let's call it, you know, we, we, this is impossible. So you need a combination of individual action, but to do that, you need some kind of um, uh, economic system accountability. You need the government regulation and the policies and, and the science. And the good thing is there's a lot of good things happening at the moment. Lots of good policies around the world, from Chile, to the European Union, to, to China, from you know, economies phasing our um, uh, petrol and diesel cars, from committing to net zero, economies by 2050. Um, Scandinavian countries like um, Iceland have started exploring you know, alternatives to GDP and the well-being economy. There's a lot of interesting things happening around the world when you look at policies. I, um, I think you know, each issue is complicated and, and needs careful exploration. So food, for example, food production. Um, it's wonderful that people are starting to produce locally and uh, it depends a little bit how you define it um, but you know we will need trade we will need trade to produce and feed you know 60 or 70 percent of the people around the world you cannot grow locally for the most part you can grow different things and you can do different things but we still rely on trade and of course people's livelihoods rely on, on trade um i i think that we all have more or less we agree that going back to what was normal before is unsustainable you know and there's a the, there's a push at the moment obviously people want to get jobs and, and economies back but that's like saying you know what um what we had previously it wasn't perfect 
but um, it kind of did the job. And that, you know, that is a completely missed opportunity if, if we go that way. The second option is what we've been, you know, we, you know, been working on the green recovery package. Many in the EU, other company, uh, countries around the world um, have been calling for a recovery package and activities that put nature, and it's interesting, I completely agree with Sebastian, it's interesting how nature has become the code work for both climate and biodiversity and ecological crisis. I think, I think that's a very positive development, but we're working, you know, build back better, greener, you know, invest in green infrastructure, um, for example. But that still, in my mind, doesn't prepare us for the crisis ahead. It doesn't build the resilience, you know, the extra, you know, the extra level of inefficiency in the system. It doesn't challenge the way we create value. It doesn't challenge the way we distribute that value. It doesn't challenge some of the economic institutions that are responsible for or, or have been synonymous for where we are at the moment. And so there is a third option here, which is the more radical one, and um, but it's probably one that um, is interesting to explore because, especially if we want to think about different types of institutions and models that will be much more resilient in the future. And that's, that's kind of the work that, that I do um, with my team at the center. We, we're trying to explore what type of business you know, can ride the crisis, can be more resilient, can be commercially successful while being inclusive, being restorative, being regenerative, being circular, and so on. And that calls from some big changes in how businesses work, what we mean by excellence, and what we mean by growth. Not the quantity, but the quality. And that is a very, you know, it's, it's easy to say, but it's a very difficult conversation to, to have, particularly when so much is at stake. So that's kind of my, um, I agree, we, we cannot ask people to, 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 to carry the burden, but we have to start challenging everyone to think differently. And, and hopefully there are some good examples out there that can, that can be a good platform for that. Ari, thank you very much. Um, Sebastian, would you like to follow on with your comments? Yes, thank you very much. And I think the, the, the question about uh, should we aim for transformation or gradual change is, of course, a question that is uh, integral to the discussion about environmental policies since the, uh, I would say, the 1972 Stockholm Conference to just say a date, but that's, that's probably even uh, older. I, I completely concur with the idea that uh, drastic change tomorrow is not possible, but I think we've managed with, uh, for instance, uh, today we have a, a um, an initiative called Deep, Deep Decarbonization Pathways, where we look at South Africa and India and what it would need, wh what it means for them to reach the socioeconomic development objectives that they have, meaning particularly reducing the inequality between the black population and the rest of the population uh, by 2050 and at the same time be low carbon. And to some extent, the idea is to find in the longer run uh, a sequence of change that's, that makes it possible to have those win-win possibilities. And in that specific case, the idea is that if you really want to get uh, more, equ uh, more equal so South Africa, more equitable South Africa, you need to reduce the, 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 the political and economic space of the mining sector in South Africa, because that's a trap where the, the black population that is trapped in the, in, the, uh, in the mining sector cannot actually move up in, the, in society. And so this socioeconomic objective is not because of climate, it's just that if you do it, then if you, if you find the key to do it, because the key question is how do you manage to do that with requalification re -qualification of workers, etc. lots of complicated programs. If you manage to do that, then you have lots of climate co-benefits. So that's just to say, of course, it's not just from one day to the other, but there is the, the idea that what we need is a transformation. And I really like, I'm, I'm not sure that I, maybe it's, uh, it's going to be obsolete in a few years, but the idea that Agenda 2030 is a transformation agenda really shows that what we need to think of 
that, that's a very good way to talk to finance people and business people, as Aris was saying, because then you, sh you think of the next business model. You, you, you understand that some of the businesses and the investments that you had before are actually stranded assets, and you can get into that type of conversation that I think is very useful. The other thing that I wanted to introduce is the idea that uh, in France, we had a, a citizens' convention on climate uh, as a kind of a response to the Yellow Vest movements. Uh, and I've been working with these 150 citizens for nearly one year now, and they've issued their, their final, voted on their final proposals. Last weekend, they're going to present it, to, they are going to present them to uh, President Macron. And it's really impressive to see that what they say is, you, uh, they've been asked to develop a set of propo propositions of public action in order to be in line with 40% 40 per, 40 reduction in greenhouse gases emissions in France in 2030. And they say two things. First, they say, yes, this mandate is necessary and legitimate. And on top of it, we add ecosystems protection. Because if, you, if, you, if we destroy the ecosystems and try to reduce the uh, greenhouse gas emissions, we're not going to be saving the plan, uh, saving our the viability of our of our society, and I think that's a very strong message from the from the citizens. And second, they say we can we can go there, but that means quite structural transformation in many sectors, and we need to address them from both economic incentives, uh, social accompanying measures, and uh, changes in the way that the uh, the business models are actually. Uh, framed by the norms and the regulation in public policy. So they are answering the government, you, we could do that, but that needs to really go a step further in the types of regulation that you've been implementing for the moment, and not only through a carbon tax, you have different levers that you need to, to play on. And that's a very good thing that I think to, to, to hear from them. The last thing they said is, I think this is really the, the, the atmosphere of the moment, is that to some extent, they say we'd be better off in, if we would be sovereign on a very local scale. And I think that's a worrying message to me because I'm, to me, the European project as such is, a, is, is very important for peace, prosperity, and, and, and lots of things. And they, they don't say that they want to, to, to Frexit, but they say that very often the competition policy, the trade policy of the European Union is a, is a problem for their transitions. And they have this myth that local is always better, more sustainable. And I concur with something that, that uh, Todoris put in the chat, saying sometimes um, food supply chains need to be resilient, they need to be global, uh, but maybe not the same type of global as we had organized before. So we need to be very cautious about the fact that this idea that relocalizing means more resilience, more sovereignty, and more, uh, and more sustainability is not always clear and it's not always the case and it's been a, quite a struggle for instance with those 150 uh, citizens to tell them that first sometimes we, if they want to buy local food it's going to is going to be uh, with more uh, greenhouse gas with, with more climate impact than something bought from uh, like, like lamb from New Zealand shipped deep frozen <laughs> I, I'm sorry for the lamb producers in France but sometimes it's right and it's a problem I mean we need to, to think over that so sometimes it's not necessarily uh, better in terms of sustainability and second if you stop buying cotton from Mali or palm oil from Indonesia, that might be a problem for development in other countries. So we have, we're interconnected also through globalization. So, so the globalization question, I think, is very problematically framed by the crisis. And we need to be cautious not to directly go to uh, uh, local equals resilience equals sustainability. And, and that's going to be a tough fight because to some extent, what the citizens were telling me is that, yes, but in food, if you get the consumer closer to the producer, it would be much easier for the consumer to understand the environmental impacts of what he's buying. And that's, that's right. The only thing is that it's not just because you're close geographically that what is produced is sustainable. But then I think behind what they said, there was a kind of a, a theory of change that I think we need to consider at least. Thank you, Sebastian. Fodori, I'm thinking that while you will be uh, preparing to comment on what we just heard, if you don't mind, I will share again the screen of our uh, voting, of our polling, and I will ask all the participants to make sure that they are still locked in on the www.menti.com using the code 610313. We have 13 people that are locked on already. And uh, I will ask you to vote on the next question that you can actually do right now. So uh, you can log on to again to the menti.com 610313 for those that are not connected 
and you can vote on those points and you can continue voting on those points. I see more people coming on and then we'll have to, we will ask you one more question and you will be able to say freely your opinion about things. And then I think we'll invite Thodoris to comment on what we heard and the closing statements by Aris and Sebastian, because unfortunately uh, we need much more time for all these very important things that have been uh, pointed out by everybody. Uh, what we see in this one is that um, there is a very important preference of everybody about improving governance, but also we see the importance of urban planning, uh, equally importantly, sustainable goods manufacturing and the food question that we have been discussing and of course disconnecting from CO2 emissions. So um, I think we can uh, keep this picture the way that it has pretty much been equitably divided between the different questions. Let me give you one or two more minutes to vote on this discussion if you like. And then I would like to leave um, everybody with a final picture that would be provided by this polling. So if you would like me to go now to the next polling question, and the next polling question is this one. It's very simple. What word comes to mind as a result of the pandemic regarding the future? Please feel free to just write one or two or three or four or five words that come to mind. And that would give us kind of a, a word cloud that will allow us to um, consider what you think very important in terms of what we should be taking into account. So please feel free. You should be seeing on your screen now the possibility to vote. Is this online already? Christina? Yes, okay. So please add your words. Our first one, relief for the planet. Sustainability is at the center. That's very interesting. Let us wait for a second and then we hear from at least another 20 people like we did for the previous one. Let me remind you that all of this material will be uploaded afterwards on our, um, our YouTube. So all of this will be up there for anyone who wants to go back and revisit those points that have been brought up by people. And I think now we have quite a good image of what people are thinking. Uh, while people are still voting, Thodori, would you like to take the floor and comment about what we have been hearing? Sure. Um, I'm very happy with, uh, with what I have been hearing here today. I expected this, of course. And thank you, Spirits, for, for facilitating this discussion. I particularly like the examples of South Africa and France, Mr. Trier mentioned. This is the messaging that seems to work. We want to solve the major social and economic problems of a community gradually. We don't want to blow up society. And we require that the solutions must be sustainable, uh, sustainability and lower emissions at the same time. Solutions that aren't environmentally friendly are not acceptable. This type of uh, problem solving in policy uh, that is very much in fashion in several uh, sectors of, um, of politics around the world is, uh, I think, the, the way forward. And I also think that the philosophy behind the Green New Deal and new uh, policies, not just environmental, but any policies in the European Union, uh, is exactly that. All solutions to problems need to lead to lower emissions and uh, environmentally friendly solutions in the future coming going forward. And I think that this is the correct message we should come out of the pandemic with. Thank you, Thodori. Thank you very much. And before I, I, you can actually stop voting now because we see that we have some things that stand out. As I said before, you will have that. And before I, I close this and thank our speakers, I would like to ask both of you, Ari and Sebastian, if you would like to make a final comment for um, one or two minutes. Let me also say before I open the floor for this, that we've had a number of questions that unfortunately we don't have the time to answer. One of them was related to the first point uh, that uh, 
in fact, some people thought that we had less use of plastic, but of course, for the personal protection measures, there was a lot of plastic that was used and is discarded in nature or in the environment as a whole. So there is a problem there. There's plenty of other things. We had questions about who is actually monitoring and, and uh, taking account of what are the changes that happened in nature and the in the environment, what are the institutes. And I think there's quite a lot. Iris is, is uh, moving his head because certainly Cambridge is one of the institutions that are doing this kind of monitoring, the University of Cambridge, I mean. Um, so uh, sorry for those that po put out questions, but for us they're very valid because there are points that we can take on through our institute, through our collaboration with the analysis to continue our discussion. And with this, uh, I would like to ask Aris and Sebastian to say a last uh, few points that they want to mention for our one or two minutes before we close down this webinar. Thank you, Aris. Uh, um, uh, thank you, Spears. So I just I really wanted to thank you for this very interesting conversation. I hope we have other other opportunities to discuss. And as I said before, we need to build a conversation about Europe within our domestic debates. So being able to exchange with the analysis is very important. And I hope that we have other types of the, those conversations. So that my first comment is let's discuss that because our national political debates and our European political debate, which actually does not exist because it's in the Brussels bubble, we need to have that really organized so that we, we go forward and that the Green Deal is supported. The last thing, I want, the second point I wanted to say is that I've been discussing this morning with Chinese colleagues. And in China, uh, the idea is that, um, I mean, this is a common, a common word that, that crisis in Chinese means both risk and opportunity. Everybody says that, but this is really what you see in China is that uh, the, the speed of change in this global country has been such that they always know that a period of time is just a trans transitory balance and equilibrium and that through a crisis you need to, to go to the next step. And I don't know exactly what the next step would look like in China. They say that the president is pushing a lot the narrative of digital and green being, being the new step of modernization of the country. But you also have lots of uh, coal industry workers that are asking for more space in the uh, in the in the recovery plans, etc. So what I what I what I want to 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 focus on with that is that we've been discussing the the speed of change in our in our countries from seen from at least from our countries, and I think it's important to bear in mind that one of the key things that we could I could use as as an environmental activist <laughs> to try and push for more. Uh, uh, audacity to be more audacious and bold in the way that we try and change the business models with the help of the Green Deal in Europe is to say that the Chinese won't wait, that they are changing for good or for bad, not necessarily in something that are completely sustainable, but they are modernizing using the, the recovery plans after the crisis to change towards a quite a new step in modernization. So we need to do our own if we want, if we don't want to be a, a laggard in that, in that type of competition. Thank you very much, Sebastian. Ari? Thank you. So um, thank you again, Spiro, and, and everyone. It's been a, a wonderful conversation. I wish we had more time. Um, so I'm, I'm in a different position with Sebastian. So I'm, I'm a European, I'm a Greek, and, and also living in a soon not to be any more European place in the UK. But Cambridge is, is, is quite international um, in a way. I think that um, what I, what I, what, um, we've learned that some very important things and, and we would know, we now know that wildlife and biodiversity is really important, played a significant role in the crisis when it comes to you know, what we need to do to, to prepare ourselves for the future. We saw how people come together around the world to support others. Many examples from Australia, South Africa, the US of quickly self-organized communities to provide for, for one another and support the public good. Um, we have many um, uh, instances where um, there is a, there is, excuse me. That's okay, we, we're very happy to, to have uh, it's, you know, families it's the, participating it's the, in our the webinar. family situation. That That's we, fantastic. We learn how actually, to yes. operate differently th these days. So. Um, I think there is a there is a there's a way we 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 saw how we can take radical policies. We saw how we can implement things in a very different way. Um, we we saw that there is a possibility for us to make things differently, and we haven't asked those questions. We haven't asked: Do we really want to work in a big office? Do we really want to travel to work every day? 
what is it that, that we value? Uh, I, and now you, you also get to meet my son. What is it That's that we great. value? Uh, is it family that we value in these situations? Do we like to spend more time at home? But I guess for me, the, the, the reality is that um, we need business to ask very difficult, um, we need people to ask very difficult and different questions than the way we've done in the past. And to accept at the center of it all is inequality. We cannot address the environmental and the nature crisis without addressing the big inequity issues in our society. Because no one will care about some of these issues until they have bread on the table. So I'll leave you, I'll leave you with that and, and the economic model that provides equity for all, that's at the center of what I think we need to do. Thank you very much, Ari. And I want to thank all of you for the re I'm sure that you will agree with me that this was one of the most rich in issues about debating uh, webinars that we have organized in the series of all those webinars that we had, the third one this time. Um, and I want to thank, first of all, Thodoris and the analysis for being with us, but also the two speakers for bringing up such a very rich uh, thematic discussion. I want to thank all of the audience that has been with us, all of you participants uh, that provided questions and points. Obviously, there is no time and it is a very complicated issue to try to summarize or, or bring up the key points. But I would just like to um, bring up the very important issue related to the need for change that also people that voted brought up uh, on how this will be done without actually bringing more pressure or harm to people that have already been suffering through this time. But also the importance of uh, keeping the geographical and institutional points that are necessary in terms of European Union, of how individualism and also the sovereignty issues are related because I remember that one speaker in a previous webinar was saying that this issue is too big to not address at a local level. So we, we need a balanced uh, view of, of these different things. Um, Todori, please uh, say any final point you would like if you want to say goodbye to our viewers. And, and then thank we'll you very much to you, Spiros, and to our viewers. And this will all be available in, uh, on YouTube, I think, so everyone can, who well, has missed part of it can uh, see it again. Thank you very much to our speakers uh, as well. It's, it's been a pleasure. Thank you all and thank you for being with us. We'll let you know when the next one is coming up. Have a great evening and thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.